Hey there, it's Jordan. I'm delighted to be joined by Shama Sawant, uh, the Seattle City Council member uh, who recently, uh, at the end of last year, uh, fought back a recall uh, that was pushed by uh, the right wing uh, in uh, Seattle, but also a lot of friendly Democrats trying to remove her uh, from office. Um, I wanted to have you on. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, but I wanted to start uh, because you've been taking on uh, the Democrats uh, for basically trying to repeal hazard pay still during the very active Omicron surge uh, uh, at grocery stores. I'll just read your tweet for a minute here. Uh, Democrats shamelessly tried to repeal uh, $4 an hour hazard pay for grocery workers during the Omicron surge, yet themselves uh, continue to meet only on Zoom for the safety of their own homes as they make six-figure salaries, you added in. Uh, can you kind of talk about, uh, A, uh, the grocery workers that will be affected by this, and B, what the Democrats' reasoning for this? Yes, and just to give a context for some of your viewers who may not know what Seattle politics is like, there are nine council members on the Seattle City Council, there are eight Democrats, and me, the lone socialist, and so it's not like they were being pushed by Republicans or the overtly right wing to do this. This was something that they uh, did uh, by themselves. And what's striking about this is that the bill itself was sponsored by some uh, by Teresa Mosqueda, who's a council member here, who uh, has the image of a labor Democrat, and she has the backing of the major uh, labor union leaderships in, locally in Seattle and King County. And that's what's so stunning about this, because we're talking about a meager $4 an hour grocery worker hazard pay during this pandemic, where our frontline workers have been some of the hardest hit and some of the most self-sacrificing to allow our society to keep running. And uh, to, for Democrats, and not only on top of that, uh, on top of that, the labor Democrats to be pushing for this was uh, quite, um, quite a scandal in my view. And to uh, also get a sense of why this is so scandalous, I think it's important to look at the uh, standard of living that grocery workers are facing. I mean, and to get a sense of how anti-worker this attempt by the Democrats was. And, and I can also give you a context of why that wasn't only an attempt and the grocery worker hazard pay is still in place, but no thanks to the Democrats because eight of them voted unanimously. I was sick on that day and I wasn't able to vote. But all year long last year, I have said that repeatedly, publicly, that not only should we keep this grocery worker hazard pay, in fact, it should be extended to all frontline workers. But to just give a sense of how bad it could be for grocery workers, look at the study released by the Economic Roundtable uh, that was um, surveying grocery workers in Washington, California, and Colorado. And this survey shows that while Kroger CEO made $22 million last year, most of the company's frontline workers faced homelessness, eviction, or hunger. To quote from the study, quote, there are workers sleeping in RVs or couch surfing or living in parks somewhere. Americans go to their local supermarket every week and smile at the person cashing them out, not aware that the person they're talking to is going to sleep in a car after they clock out, end quote. That is how stunning this is that council members uh, who are sitting safe in their home and doing their job through the Zoom calls are basically proclaiming that we don't need any more protections for grocery workers. And by the way, uh, I think the study you're talking about, 14% of Kroger workers had experienced homelessness in, within the past year, not to, men not to mention, I, I mean, it was very high in terms of food insecurity for Kroger workers. So this is a systemic issue, by the way, not just at Kroger, but that was what the study was about. I also wanted to show, because you referenced a, a union leader, um, this is, uh, you had tweeted this, but this is that that union leader who basically called it a Band-Aid. Sawant wants to argue about how long to keep the Band-Aid on, while some of us are focused on mending the wound. Well, how are they exactly focused on mending the wound? Do, do, are they, have they been fighting to instead of making this hazard pay to actually just raise their wages by four or five dollars an hour? I mean, I'm sure if you talk to the leaders, they will say that they have been, but look at let's look at it concretely as well, right? Because uh, the workers, I, I, many of them are, uh, I think, heading into contract battles this year. 
So I will ask just a very simple question. How in any universe can you claim that it is going to put pressure on the Kroger bosses to give a four or higher dollar pay, or dollar an hour pay for workers permanently when you are freely letting go what you have already won temporarily? You know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a simple question of what really allows you to have power in the bargaining, especially in the context of workers being so, you know, it's being, being a David versus Goliath kind of fight where Kroger Corporation is so powerful and workers need to fight collectively. In other words, my point is that we absolutely need unions because otherwise, uh, without, without a collective struggle, workers, individual workers have no hope of fighting the system, fighting capitalism, gaining any kind of change, let alone any kind of systemic shifts in society. Uh, but what kind of unions we need? That is the key question here. It's not, you know, unions are very popular now. Since 1965, this is, the unions have never been as popular as they are now. It also raises the question of what kind of unions we need, and then we really need fighting unions. We actually are not going to win for workers if we have union leadership saying things like this, where uh, that, that they're saying that, well, you know, let's let go of what we have won temporarily. And somehow that is going to be magically the jumping off point, the launching pad to win major victories when you head into contract battles. That, that's not how it works. It would be disingenuous for any union leader to suggest that. And I think it points towards uh, having very strong rank and file led militant fighting strategy in unions. Well, I also think, um, you know, we saw a recent study came out that billionaires added five trillion dollars to their wealth during this pandemic. And I know a lot of the media wants to kind of put the pandemic in like past tense. I think that's crazy. I mean, we could talk about that later. But uh, I mean, it, it's not like uh, the uh, the the wealthies gains are temporary. They're not the wealthies gains are not being pulled back or, oh, you know, that was just for now. So it, it just seems like there's something wrong when during a pandemic, uh, the wealthy and billionaires added $5 trillion to their wealth, but you have it almost as like kind of common in, in, I don't know, government psychology and, and mentality that, oh, no, 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 the workers, if they were such heroes, no, we're not going to make that permanent. We're going to call it a Band-Aid and peel it back. That's an extremely good point, Jordan. I'm so glad you put it that way. The trillions of dollars that the billionaires have earned, those are not temporary. I mean, not unless we have a systemic shift away from capitalism towards socialism, which is why I'm a socialist. But that's the, that's a very important point. That the gains that big business and the wealthiest in our society under capitalism make, those are not treated as temporary. In fact, let me give you another example also, which I'm sure you've discussed on your show. Uh, the millions of foreclosures that happened to working class and middle class homeowners in the wake of the Great Recession, that home ownership, which was, you know, in, in many ways, home ownership is the only equity yeah. that millions of Americans have, the only kind of equity, if at, if at all you have it. And most young people, millennials, renters don't have any of that. Um, but that wealth, that all those homes that were foreclosed on, they were not made back to middle class people or, or uh, working class people. They went into the hands of private equity. And in fact, you have a worse situation now in terms of you know, the lopsided home ownership wealth uh, than you had before the Great Recession. So that is absolutely a brilliant point. And in fact, it's really important to note that uh, this discussion about temporary versus permanent has come up in terms of hazard pay. It's also been true of all the stimulus measures, the child care tax, tax credits or the student debt you know, forgiveness, but all of that has been temporary. And what we need is systemic changes. We need permanent changes. But it is all disingenuous for union leaders who are leading the charge on letting go of temporary measures like hazard pay to claim that somehow that's a launching pad to win uh, permanent gains. We have to call the lie on that and understand that as a matter of fact, what would have been a better strategy would have been to not only retain the hazard pay and to also say that all frontline workers should get that hazard pay as well. Uh, there's another thing that um, this, uh, this union leader tweet also said, which I found quite um, just really stunning in terms of how it doesn't represent the interests of working people and union members, which is, 
uh, one of the justifications that both these union leaders who allowed the hazard pay to to that vote to happen uh, just keep in mind that the hazard pay is still in place but that's ironically because the corporate mayor Durkin outgoing mayor actually vetoed that bill uh, because she took this opportunity to upstage the so-called progressive democrats and say no actually this is not the point this is not the moment in time to uh, repeal the hazard pay omicron is surging so that's another example of how the corporate wing of the Democratic Party, the right wing, actually can end up upstaging the so-called progressives when progressives sell workers out. All it does is create room for the more conservative Democrats or, or, or the outright right wing to take charge. And in reality, uh, it is, it's quite problematic that uh, the, the, the Democrats who brought this forward and voted for it unanimously, what they said was that uh, when well, you know Seattle's hazard pay for grocery workers has been the most generous in in in, a, in a, uh, of any state of any city, and that it has been the longest lasting, and I find that deeply offensive towards our workers because that's like saying, oh, you workers, you should be thankful that we were so generous that we gave you uh, more dollars an hour than our grocery workers in other cities and be happy be thankful that it, it lasted as long as it lasted and don't ask for anything more because other workers don't have anything do you know what that is that is the argument of the race to the bottom telling workers that you should be happy because workers elsewhere are worse off than you that is the exact logic that workers need to reject because that is what benefits the ruling class by having us pitted against each other instead what we should be having what the argument that union leaders should be making and unfortunately they're not they have not been making is that we not only need to retain the best that we had one in seattle but that we should win the same for all frontline workers in all cities across the nation thanks for watching and make sure to tune in to status coups daily live stream monday through thursday at five o'clock eastern time and fridays at four o'clock eastern time